Welcome to the War Academy channel. When we study the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, one of the main questions is, when were the Germans aware that their military operation was not going to be as successful as expected? How was the moment when they realized that they had underestimated the Red Army? In today's program we are going to analyze this question, using for it the own letters and annotations of the famous General Heinrich I, who was in the 2nd Panzer Army during Operation Barbarossa, under Guderian in Army Group Center. To Heinrich I's testimonies, in which it is progressively seen how the situation is becoming more and more critical, we will add some others from Halder, Guderian, and Bach. The first of these letters was written two days after the start of Barbarossa, specifically on June 24. In this letter that Heinrich I sends to his wife, he indicates, the Soviet soldier fights tenaciously. He is a much better soldier than the French. They are extremely tough, devious, and treacherous. Everywhere, in the great forests and on countless farms, there are stray soldiers who often shoot us in the back. The Russian wages a war treacherously. Here we can see that the Soviet soldiers do not give up easily, as in previous campaigns had happened with the enemies that Germany had faced. This, as we will see below, will make any battle much more fierce, and the advance estimated by the German high command will be slower. To the fierce resistance of the Red Army, we must add another factor that is indicated in the following letter of July 6. It says like this. Our troops are compressed due to the conditions on the ground, and this makes our advance much slower than expected. The unfortunate state of the roads makes progress very difficult. For God's sake, this is a primitive country. North of the Pripyat swamps there are forests everywhere and between them swamps a kilometer wide, where one can sink up to one's knees. After the short and continuous rains, the roads turn into muddy tracks that are only passable in some places after great efforts by our engineers. As we have seen in other programs, one of the biggest challenges of Operation Barbarossa was logistics. The lack of trucks, as well as railway tracks with adequate gauge, added to the poor state of the roads, made it increasingly difficult to get supplies to the frontline troops. This soon caused food, ammunition, and spare parts to be rationed. In the next two letters, we are going to see another of the problems that the German army faced from practically the first day of advance by the Soviet Union. The first letter is dated July 8 and reads thus. Now we are far behind the motorized divisions. We march between 30 and 35 kilometers a day, and the horses have a lot of difficulty moving along the sandy roads, but we must continue moving forward. Later on July 11th, with the Battle of Smolensko in full swing, Heinrich I wrote again the following. Yesterday, one regiment marched 54 kilometers on foot, and another 47. To do it once is possible, but to do it after having made numerous marches of between 30 and 40 kilometers is a tremendous thing. To achieve this nobody sleeps at night. They start at 2 or 3 in the morning and last until night falls again at 10. To this we could add thousands of testimonies from soldiers who say they can't take it anymore, and that they are making an inhumane effort. Here we can appreciate another of the great problems that occurred during this operation, in which the infantry was unable to reach the vanguard motorized divisions, and this led to chaotic situations in which the entire front was full of gaps. When this campaign is analyzed, the great encirclements made by the Germans, in which they capture millions of Soviet prisoners, are very striking. However, closing these bags was always a complicated task and hundreds of thousands of Red Army soldiers managed to escape. As of the next entry, dated August 3rd, another more desperate tone will begin to be seen, in which it can be seen that victory is getting further and further away. Heinrich I's text reads thus. When enemy units are destroyed, the Soviets send new troops to the front and attack again. How the Russians do it is beyond my knowledge. Meanwhile, we barely received any replacements. Sometimes we wonder what winter will bring. We will most certainly have to remain here in Russia. So we will have to endure a war of positions along a huge front. What a wonderful perspective. The next testimony we are going to see is that of Marshal von Bach, Commander-in-Chief of Army Group Center, dated August 7th. 
In any case, the situation is extremely tense. If I want to create a reservation and try to take out a division for it, I am told that it is impossible. If a division deployed in the rear area of the army reaches the front, they take it from me, and send it to the north or south group. The truth is that I don't know exactly how a new operation is going to take place in this situation, and with the slow and gradual decline in the combat strength of our divisions, which are always fighting. Although on the other hand, there is no doubt that things are worse for the Russians. This note by Bach refers to the fact that during much of August, the German army was paralyzed without knowing where to go. It was clear that they had not achieved the expected success, and that the campaign in Russia was far from over. The troops of the center group, who had the objective of reaching Moscow, were divided to send aid to both the north and the south, and this made their commander-in-chief desperate, as we have just seen. A few days later, specifically on August 10, Guderian scored. As long as agreed spare parts and engines remain undelivered, the situation of the panzer forces cannot be satisfactorily improved. It would not be correct to remain inactive while waiting for new refurbishment tasks. In the absence of spare parts and engines, the rest period will not produce any appreciable improvement. Time is running in favor of the enemy, not us. The context of this situation was the break in the offensives of the Edgercito Centro group, which urgently needed a break to recover. Even so, and despite his weakened forces, Guderian continued to be in favor of continuing to attack, and in the end he had no choice but to move south, to capture the city of Kiev. Below we are going to see the testimony of one of the most important men of this offensive, and who had been more optimistic since it began, even declaring at the beginning of July that the Soviet Union had been totally defeated. As we are going to see, a month later Halder would say the following. Regarding the general situation, it is becoming increasingly clear that we have underestimated the Russian colossus, which consciously prepared for war with total lack of scruples, as can be expected from a totalitarian state. At the beginning of the war we had calculated that the Red Army had a total of about 200 divisions. We have now identified more than 360. These divisions are not armed and equipped in a similar way to ours, and tactically they are very poorly led. But in any case, those divisions are there and when we destroy a dozen of them, another 12 appear in their place instantly. The Soviets are favored by the factor of time, since they are close to their own centers of power and production, while we are moving further and further from ours. The penultimate testimony that we are going to see is again from Heinrichsai, which alludes to a very striking matter. And it is that despite what we usually think about the domain of the skies during Operation Barbarossa, it seems that it was quite different from August and September. In early August Heinrichsai noted, the enemy has enjoyed complete air superiority throughout the day. The division has so far suffered heavy losses from bombing raids. The Red Air Force owns the sky, and we have no German fighter cover. And finally, and already at the beginning of September, the Army Corps that Heinrichs I commanded, would issue the following report. This war is going to last longer than we would like. The days of Blitzkrieg are over. The German army fighting in Russia is like an elephant attacking an anthill. The elephant will kill thousands, perhaps millions of ants, but ultimately the sheer force of their numbers will overpower the elephant, and it will be eaten to the bone. As we can see at this early date, many were already announcing a defeat against the Soviet Union. Well, so far this program in which we have tried to make a summary as complete as possible on this matter. If you want to expand on the topic, I recommend the live show we did with Carlos Caballero on Operation Barbarossa, and of course this book by David Stahel. We say goodbye here. Many thanks to everyone, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you in the next one. See you soon.